Okay, we're gonna talk about the action potentials of contractile heart muscle cells and answer the questions. What ion channels are used for contractile action potentials and what does the graph for the action potentials look like? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. SA nodal cells spontaneously fire action potentials that propagate through contractile cardiac muscle cells causing calcium-induced calcium release which initiates their contraction. What does this look like? To show that, here's a voltmeter with its microelectrode and its reference electrode, and this measures the voltage difference between the inside and outside of a cell membrane. Here's a contractile cardiac muscle cell. When you put the microelectrode inside, it measures a difference of negative 80 millivolts, and it stays that way at rest, unlike SA nodal cells that have automaticity. And this contractile cell will stay at negative 80 millivolts at rest until an adjacent action potential causes a cell to reach threshold, about negative 60 millivolts, and then depolarizes. Action potentials are produced by ionic currents flowing through ion channels. What causes these ion currents? These ions flowing through these ion channels. So uh, let's learn a little bit more about these ion channels, shall we? The first is the sodium current through a voltage-gated sodium channel. This channel opens when threshold is reached at negative 60 millivolts, allowing an influx of sodium that rapidly depolarizes the membrane, generates the upstroke, and at the peak of the upstroke, positive 20 millivolts, transforms to an inactive state. It cannot open. And it remains this way until the membrane repolarizes to negative 80 millivolts and then transforms to the closed state, which has the potential to open. Voltage-gated sodium channels are unique. They have three states. The first state is closed. It's impermeable to sodium, but it has the potential to open. The second state occurs when threshold is reached at negative 60 millivolts. The channel opens, allowing an influx of sodium. The third state is inactive. At the peak of the upstroke at positive 20 millivolts, the, the inactive state makes this gate impermeable to sodium, but it's the refractory period. The channel cannot open until the membrane repolarizes back to negative 80 millivolts, which then causes the channel to go back to the closed state. If you're like, I can't remember that, go to here and there's a whole video that I made on voltage-gated sodium channels. Next is the transient outward current by the transient outward potassium channel. This is voltage-gated. It opens at the peak of the upstroke, allowing an efflux of potassium that initiates repolarization. And once these gates open, they close almost immediately. The calcium current through the L-type calcium channel is voltage gated. It opens slowly during the upstroke. And when it is open, it allows an influx of calcium that results in the plateau phase during um, phase two of this action potential. That little influx of calcium binds to the ryanidine receptors, causing calcium-induced calcium release. The L-type calcium channels close as the membrane repolarizes. And next, we'll talk about the potassium current through the potassium channel. These are voltage-gated. They open at the peak of the upstroke and allowing an efflux of potassium that repolarizes the membrane. And then these gates close when the membrane repolarizes. All right, that was fun. Let's put all this together and do it again. Here, that negative 80 millivolts represents, for this one contractile cardiac muscle cell, its resting membrane potential. And it will stay at negative 80 millivolts until, watch, an approaching action potential through the gap junctions influences this resting membrane potential until it reaches negative 60 millivolts threshold, at which time the Voltage-gated sodium channels open, allowing an influx of sodium, which causes the membrane to depolarize to positive 20 millivolts, causing these voltage-gated sodium channels to become inactive. But the transient outward channels open, allowing an efflux of potassium that initially starts to repolarize the membrane and around zero millivolts closes this channel. But the calcium and potassium channels both open, allowing an influx of calcium and an efflux of potassium at the same time. There's always a little bit more potassium effluxing. Um, 
And around negative 10-ish millivolts, the L-type calcium channels close, maybe like negative 20 millivolts, it'll close. So now all we have is the efflux of potassium that will continue to efflux until the membrane completely repolarizes back to negative 80 millivolts, at which time these potassium channels close. During this whole action potential, the sodium potassium pump is restoring sodium and potassium concentrations inside and outside the cell by pumping against its gradient three sodium ions and pumping in two potassium ions against its gradient. That's why you need to use ATP. Let's shine a spotlight for a second on this L-type calcium channel and put it in its context in the sarcolemma or the cell membrane of this contractile heart muscle cell. It's voltage gated, so during the upstroke, uh, the depolarizing phase, the L-type calcium channel slowly opens and allows an influx of calcium. That's that blue dot is calcium, which then the calcium binds to the ryanidine uh, receptor, which is a ligand-gated calcium channel. The ryanidine receptor opens. The opening allows calcium to flood from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm, at which time the calcium then through the troponin tropomyosin complex causes the myosin and actin to shing, do that, contract, systole. This is the contraction of the pumping of the heart. But point over here, you see this L-type calcium channel, calcium induced, calcium release through the ryanidine receptor. That was fun. Let's do it one more time except using the graph of this contractile heart muscle cell action potential. Here's phase four where the IK1 potassium channels are the same as the potassium leak channels. These channels are the ones that establish and maintain the resting membrane potential not only of these contractile heart muscle cells, but of all of our body cells except for SA and AV nodal cells. And this enables the contractile cell to stay at negative 80 millivolts unless an approaching action potential causes this creep of the membrane potential to reach threshold and at negative 60 millivolts, bam, phase zero. The voltage-gated sodium channels open, allowing a rapid sodium influx and this rapid upstroke and depolarization event. That then causes at the peak, phase one, which is the transient outward potassium channels open. Uh, that efflux of potassium causes the initial repolarization. And at this point, the in activation of voltage-gated sodium channels. Next is phase two, where the um, transient outward potassium channels are closing. The L-type calcium channels open, which results in the uh, calcium-induced calcium release. And the other potassium channels are now open. So there's a calcium influx that's balanced by the calcium, uh, calcium influx is balanced by the potassium efflux. This is the plateau phase. Next is phase three, where the, where the calcium channels close, there is the potassium efflux via the potassium channels and the rapid repolarization of the membrane. And finally to phase four, where the voltage-gated sodium channels transition to the closed state, and we're right back to the very beginning. And that, my friends, is the action potential of contractile heart muscle cells in a nutshell. I just want to give a big thank you to Dr. Ken Spitzer for his expertise and mentoring over the years and topics of cardiovascular physiology, a fantastic educator and a fantastic individual. Thank you, Ken. Here's a picture of him racing cars into his 80s. Dr. Spitzer, thank you.